Falcon for a minute here. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, welcome, guys. Uh, we're going to be talking about project management today. Do I have any project managers in the room with me? Okay, I've got a few. Who is a playing project manager and that's not their day job? <laughs> got a lot of those. Okay. All right, so basically what we're going to be talking about today is some of the different things that we have to deal with when we're either being a project manager or playing one on TV and trying to figure out how to get through everything. So a little bit about me. My name is Jess Karofis. I'm a technical project manager at Black Mesh. Uh, you can find me on my Twitter handle. I also have a blog on the uh, Black Mesh website. So what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to go over what defines a project so we actually know when we're dealing with a project versus maybe something that may not be considered one. We're going to go over scope, what it is, how we deal with it, how to figure out what our tasks are, any of our dependencies, scheduling, stakeholders, expectations, which is a big part of what we do. I'm going to touch a little bit about risk. If I went into all of risk, we'd be here until tomorrow and then tools and any questions you guys might have. So let's talk about what a project is. A project is really something that's considered temporary in nature. So it's not something that we're doing all the time, like a systems upgrade or changing the oil in our car or anything like that. It's something that's very temporary, but it also creates a unique product or service. So if I look at that and I use that definition, if I'm building a bridge, is that considered a project? See, nodding, yes. What about software upgrades? Those considered project? I see some yes, some no. Why would you say it's a project? You're, you have a certain set of features that you're rolling out as a kind of defined outcome that you're after. It's got a time box around it so many weeks or months or whatever, ideally. OK, so it's unique. Like it, it's like a project, even though it's part of a continuous product. OK, and then I saw a no. So we're saying unique features and time boxed for yes. What's our, uh, why are you saying no? Okay, so it sounds like maintenance. It's actually not considered a project. It's considered a task because it is something that we do regularly and we should put a process around it, absolutely. Very big on putting a process around my upgrades, but I'm not necessarily gonna consider it a project because it is repetitive. It's not a unique thing. It's not temporary in nature. Software upgrades are always, always gonna be a part of our lives. What about processing insurance claims? Project or not a project? No. Nope, not a project. Same thing every time. Creating a new website? Yes. Absolutely a project. Writing a book? Yes. yes, new project. All right, so we know what we're dealing with. We know we have a project. What's our next step? Our next step is really gonna be to start looking at scope. And I know this comic has kinda been going around the internet for a very long time. But to me, it really drives home the importance of scope is we all speak English, we're all speaking similar words, but we don't always speak the same language. What, what, when you say swing, I hear tire swing or someone else hears roller coaster. So it's really um, important for us to, to figure out what, what it is we're exactly building, which is why I love this, this comic. And scope is really defined as the work that needs to be accomplished to deliver that product, service, or result with a specified feature or functions. So when we're setting out on our project, we need to know what it is we're exactly building or doing or trying to accomplish. So how do we go about doing that? First, thing is, first things first is we're gonna start talking about it. We're gonna have, we need to figure out what our constraints are, what our requirements are, who's involved, what, what are we trying to do here exactly? And figuring out that we're, and make sure we're documenting it as well. So we wanna make sure that we have the right people doing the right work and the right job for us at the right time. So for scope, it's gonna start very, very general. I wanna swing. Start, let's walk through this. I want to swing. <laughs> okay, that's great. What type of swing do you want? Do you want a tire swing? Do you want this 
weird triple decker swing? Do you want one that's going through the tree? Do you really want a roller coaster? What, what are the features that you need for that swing? And you're gonna start getting narrower and narrower and narrower. So some of the starting places you're gonna have for that are things like your stakeholders, and we're gonna talk about identifying those, but some, a lot of people get a project charter. It's a great place to start is going through that project charter and seeing what people are looking for, seeing what, what we're being paid to do. For most of us, we have clients coming to us and saying, I need X or I need Y. So we're gonna start going through and we're gonna start creating that list. And we're gonna be as granular as we can be because it's that whole language piece. If I just say a swing, I could wind up with anything. But if I say I want a tire swing that hangs exactly this far from the ground and it's this big of a tire and it's this color of a tire and it's used with this kind of rope that holds it onto this type of tree, I've got a much better chance of hitting what it is I'm actually looking for. So my scope is where I'm going to spend a lot of time up front on my project, is I need to make sure I know what I'm building before I go build it. Or else I'm going to start with the whole, well, is this what you wanted? No, not really? Oh, okay. Um, we'll, we'll start over. And Agile has helped with the scope piece. If you look at the Agile methodology, you have a lot more checkpoints than you did in Waterfall. But still, you need to know what you're trying to build before you go into it. And then there's the dreaded scope creep, which a lot of you, I'm sure, have heard uh, the project managers talking about. And every time you have a change, they're like, no, that's scope creep, and here's why. And I think we've all been this guy in the grocery store. I know I have. It's like, oh, I just need three things. It'll be fine. I'm just going to grab the basket and go. It's not a big deal. And then it's like, oh, but I need this. Oh, maybe I need some milk, too, <laughs> and you know, uh, some lettuce, and some other things. So I think. For me, it's helpful if you just accept that scope creep is going to happen. It's going to be a part of your project. Something is going to change. And when, you when you're dealing with scope creep, which basically all that is, is it's, OK, well, something I wanted I didn't ask for, and now I'm asking you to add. When you're dealing with that, it's better to have a plan up front with how you're going to handle that scope creep. You need to accept that it's going to happen at some point. In your project, someone is going to change their mind. Or some, some requirement got miscommunicated, or something happened where it's not, not what you're expecting it to be. So we know that we're going to have it. What do we do with it? My thing with scope creep is to make sure that you have a plan to address it day one. Make sure everyone's on board. This is what we're doing. We're going to be as specific as possible, but if there's a change, this is how we're going to handle it. And the biggest key with that is communication. You've got to keep talking to your stakeholders, talking to your project team. And then when that change comes up, you've got to evaluate what it's going to do to your project. And you can go, OK, you want to change this piece of your, your project. So here are your choices. You can give me more money to add more people. You can give me more time <laughs> to get this done for you or we can drop other features. So it's really taking and evaluating what that change's impact is. Figuring out, OK, so here are all your choices. If I have a preference to what choice I want you to take. I'm going to make a recommendation and tell you why I'm making that recommendation. So I may say, you know, I really think we should add more time because this piece is critical. We went through all of your other features. It's really not smart for us to cut anything con considering Oh, thank you, auto update, considering uh, what you've got going on. Are we going to behave? OK. Sorry about that. So figure out your change request policy and figure out who are the right people to get involved when those changes come in and when people want to change the project. Because just because you have one person saying it's OK, you need to make sure it's the right person saying that it's OK. All right, so now we know what we're building. We've got to go through this process. And this process is going to vary a little bit depending on what methodology you're using to manage your project. But it's going to be the same idea. It's just going to be when you do each piece. Um, you need to know exactly what you need to do to build what you're looking to build. And there are different methods. With uh, Agile, you usually do the sticky notes and do the storyboards and the user stories. 
with waterfall, you usually wind up with something that looks like this, and you try to figure out all your dependencies up front and figure out who's doing what when. But really, your inputs are going to be your scope, your lessons learned from anything you've done that's been similar to this, your subject matter experts, and anything in your organizational process. So if you have rules of your organization that are not necessarily a hard dependency, but something you have to do, for example, we're in hosting. We don't, we don't make your site live until we have monitoring turned on. You know, that's, there's no technical reason for us not to turn on monitoring, but that's our organizational policy because it's a horrible idea for us to turn your site live without knowing if it goes down. So that, that type of stuff is also going to be an input into this list. And then you're going to start determining your major deliverables. And this can, again, the, the way you do this will vary depending on which methodology you're using. But you, know, you have to design something before you can start programming. You need to know exact, at least a little bit about it before you can start coding for it. So you're going to start getting those, those purple ones and purple lines there of design, program, test, release. However that looks in your organization, this is going to look a little different. And then you're going to start breaking it down even further and even further. And depending, again, on which methodology you're using, it may be into stories, it may be into tasks that are, I think PMI's thing for waterfalls, eight to 40 hours. So it really depends on how you want to do that. And you're just going to keep going until you figure it out. There are other ways to do this. You can do it in outline format. You can do it in bubble format. You can do it in sticky notes across the, the whiteboard. The, the major part point here is you need to figure out what you've got to do to accomplish your project. So once you've figured out what it is exactly that you are doing, you need to start figuring out if you have any dependencies. So there are a couple different categories of dependency. You've got your mandatory versus discretionary. Your mandatory is a very hard logic. So there are physical limitations here. You cannot code a website if you don't have a computer on which to code. It's, there's just nothing there. to You can't do anything. So those are your mandatory ones. Those are the ones that cannot move until the one is solved. And then there's the soft one, and that's based on knowledge of best practices. And this goes back to that whole monitoring example I was just using, right? Is, eh, technically, I can launch <laughs> without monitoring, but I don't think any of us want that to happen. So those are, the, those are mandatory versus discretionary. And they're, they're both very important. One, you obviously cannot work around if there's a physical barrier for you to do it. But the soft ones, a lot of times, you don't want to work around. And then you've also got your external versus internal. So external is going to be outside your project team's control. Um, it's based on relationships between project activities and maybe outside of the project activities. So for example, if your project team is waiting on a software deliverable from another project team, that's an external de uh, dependency because you guys have no influence over that. You can work with that project team. You can ask them, you know, how are things going? You realize that I'm waiting on you for this. We need you to hit this target. How can we help? But really, you're not in control of that external dependency. Um, another example would be hardware. If you ordered hardware and you're waiting for it to be manufactured, not a whole lot you can do. You can write it in the contract. You can hope they listen to the contract. But there are things outside your control there. And then in the internal is within your project team's control. So you have that ability to actually influence it and know the different relationship between the activities. So if I'm waiting on a project team member to finish their code before I can do it, we're all on the same project, we, can, we have control over that. So how do I identify these, these dependencies? A lot of times it's going to be just brainstorming and categorizing, especially if this is something new that we've never done before. We don't have a lot of those past lessons. But if we do have them, that's certainly going to be what, what comes in. So we're going to take a look at everything we have to do. We're going to try to identify anywhere where we think there might be a dependency. So I can't start coding until I have the right software on my machine, or my server's set up, or, <laughs> or I get design in. 
So those are the different types of dependencies we can start figuring out. And you're gonna rely on a lot of your subject matter experts for this input. As a project manager, you're probably not gonna know all of them. You probably aren't gonna know most of them if it's your first or second project and you're brand new to whatever you're doing. So as you do this more often and as you have software projects more often, there are some that you're automatically gonna know about. And you're just gonna be like, yep, these are all the dependencies I have. Now team, come tell me what dependencies you have. But as you're getting started, you're gonna rely more and more on your subject matter experts for this. And then the next part you need to start talking about is, okay, I know I have all these dependencies, but now when do they have to be done in order for me not to delay what's dependent on them? That's where you start figuring out where things go in your schedule and then trying to figure out what type of dependency is it, it is. Is it internal, external, mandatory, or discretionary? Or more than one of those. And once you start categorizing those, you can also start figuring out how to deal with them and that kind of dovetails into the whole risk discussion we'll have in a little bit here. And then you also want to document your dependencies. So if... <laughs> If you've talked about them and you know about them, it doesn't do any good until you write them down so everyone else knows about them and you communi can communicate them out to your team. And then as you're going through your schedule, make sure you confirm that you have your dependencies covered. Okay, I have task A. For task A to start, I need dependencies one, two, three. Any other dependencies? Are these still legitimate dependencies? <laughs> tell me, you know, tell me is this still right? And then as you go through your project and you learn things about your project, you're gonna just keep looking for more dependencies because usually along the way, things will unearth themselves and people will be like, I kind of forgot to tell you that I need this little piece before I can keep going. So you wanna, it's not something you just do up front and then forget about. You're gonna keep, keep visiting that and keep reviewing it. So to manage your dependencies, because we love managing things as project managers, First step is going to be to the, the identification and documentation of them that we just talked about. Then you're going to have to align them the best you can. If you have external dependencies, make sure that everyone's on the same page. The external dependency you're dependent on knows about it. So if they have issues, they can tell you as soon as possible. Align your timelines, make sure that you guys stay in communication with your external dependencies and then just keep an eye on them. And if you see one kind of going off the rails, Keep it, try to get it back into where it belongs. So I know what I'm doing. I've got my scope, I've got my tasks. My next thing is gonna be schedule. And there's a few things that go into schedule. We've got your task list, which we just talked about. Your resources, so do I have the right people? If I have the right people, do I have all their time? Do I have some of their time? When do I have their time? Um, a lot of things that people I see get bid on is effort versus duration. So I've got a task that takes 40 hours. I've got a resource who I have 50% of his time. I schedule him for a week to do that 40 hour task. My math does not work now because I've only got 20 hours of his time. So that is, that is the area where I've seen most project managers get bid is that whole effort versus duration because and customers as well, because they don't realize it. They're like, well, this task starts today, so it's gonna be done in a week, right? And you're like, well, no. I've got this person for 50% of their time, so I need two weeks to hit that 40 hours. So you need to make sure you balance that when you publish those dates to your client or to your project team or to whoever it is that you're working with people actually know that, okay, this is, actual, this is the date, it's not, oh, it's a week-long activity, as soon as we start, it's done in a week. That is, um, that's, that's a big one that I've seen many, I've, I know I've been bitten by it when I was first starting as well. So, and then you're gonna have your dependencies that you're gonna keep in, into that. So, make sure you know that your schedule's gonna change. It's a project, everything's gonna change at some point yet to meet a project where at least one thing didn't change from start to finish. So make sure you know how to handle those changes. Do you have time in your schedule where if something drops, you've got a little extra time? Not usually. Um, let's, <laughs> let's be honest with ourselves. We usually don't. We're usually trying to cram everything in. Are there contingencies I can put in place at this point? Is there anything that I see that might be a problem if it slips? 
And then it's again keeping constant contact with your project team and see if things are starting to go a little slower, figure out why. Figure out is there anything you can help them to unblock them. Figure out is there anything we can do, do we need more people, do we need more money, which again we usually don't get, but <laughs> it's how do we solve this problem because as the project manager you're also there to help unblock your people when they get stuck. So biggest players here are your stakeholders. Um, stakeholders have a variety of different definitions and different roles. Um, you can, you've got your employees, can be, are your stakeholders, your project team, if you're a public company, shareholders, your customers, community, I and mean, you've got, if this project is impacting them, they are a stakeholder. Now, not all stakeholders are created equal. Um, we're going to go into identification uh, in the next slide of your stakeholders. There's a couple ways I've seen people classify their stakeholders, one being internal versus external. So if, um, if they're an internal, they're a group within, uh, within the business or the people who, are directly, who work directly within the business. So they are your employees, your project team. Or there's also external where they are outside of the business. There's also direct versus indirect. Your directs are, they're, uh, they're directly impacted by the project versus a peripheral impact on the project. So when we talk a little bit about identification and analysis, we need to figure out who our stakeholders are. We need to figure out who's important in that stakeholder list because given our definition of who can be a stakeholder, and this could be anybody, especially if you're in the business of designing a website, it could be the entire world because they're going to be impacted if they go to your website. So you need to find out a way to identify and figure out which stakeholders are the important ones to listen to and which ones you need to add, how you need to treat each stakeholder. So when you're going through and you're making your list of who, who, who your stakeholders are, you've got influence versus interest. And this is really how you can figure out who you can use to your advantage, who you need to communicate with a little bit more who you, can, who you can rely on and who you need to come to when you've got changes. So I'm going to start in the top left and you've got someone who's high influence and low interest. So this is a tricky person because they've got a lot of influence but they're not really interested in what you're doing. So if they use their, if you get on their bad side they can use that influence not in a good way for your project. So what you want to be doing and how you want to treat them is Get them engaged. Consult them a little bit. Figure out what their needs are. Try to get that increase, increase that level of interest and see if you can move them over to the right, which is key player. And that's the person that you really want to keep engaged and on your side if you can. Um, some key players you can't, but <laughs> those are the people you really do want to keep, keep engaged and keep moving and you're going to focus your effort on this group of key players. So if you have, um, you know, the person paying your bill is usually going to be a key player. Um, a lot of your, the people in your client base are going to be your key players. You want to involve them in the decision making. You want to make sure they are engaged and consulted on a regular basis. These are the people you're going to be talking to a lot for your statuses, for your decision making. That's where your key player is going to come in. And the more people you can move on the high influence, low interest over to that key player, the better off you're going to be because you've got the, the right people who can influence the direction of your project. And if we go down a level, we've got the low influence and low interest. You're going to keep them informed if they want to be. It's going to be general communication, maybe an email status update or a newsletter. You're going to just let them know what's going on but not really do a whole lot with them. If you do find interest picking up, you're going to want to aim to move them to the right, which is high interest, low influence. These guys are going to want to just show them consideration and use that interest to your, to your benefit if you can. Um, you know, involve them in the low risk stuff where it's an easy decision that it's an easy win. They can feel more involved. You've got a cheerleader on the ground for you. If it's a not so popular project, it's always good to have as many of those around as you can. 
consult them in their interest area, keep them informed in their interest area, and then use them as that positive influence if you can. And just have them help you, especially with some of our projects bring about change, and as humans, we're not, we're not so good with change sometimes. So it's always good to have those folks on your side. So how do I manage my stakeholders? Communication is the biggest thing here, is we need to know who wants to know what, when, do they have a preferred way to be communicated with, do they want an email, do they want a phone call, do they want an IM, do they not care? <laughs> um, but when I, need an, when I need an answer from them, I need to know how to get a hold of them and how the best way to get a hold of them is. And then I also need to understand their needs, and that's the biggest point is, you know, we've got stakeholders who are spending all this money on this solution. They're going to have their own needs that need to be filled. Are they nervous about something? Have they been bitten by somebody in the past? What's, you know, what's going on there? And some of them will open up to you, which makes life really easy if they're just going to be like, well, yeah, just got burned from my last software dev shop and here's why and here's what I need from you so I feel better about moving forward and I'm comfortable and some of them are like I don't understand any of this just make it happen show me a pretty picture at the end of the day and I'm good so you really need to understand where your stakeholders are coming from and what's driving them especially for those key players that have that influence and power and interest in your project you want to see what those needs are so you can make sure you're meeting them and building that partnership between you and them. Sometimes that means they need a daily call. I have one project where my main player, at the height of the project, I was talking to seven times a day on Skype, on a Skype call. Um, thankfully, that only lasted a couple weeks, but that's what he needed to feel comfortable to move forward in this massive project that we were working on. So sometimes it's a balance of finding the time to have seven calls in one day, and sometimes it's finding another way to make them feel comfortable. But ultimately, you want to be communicating and want to have that partnership with your stakeholder, especially your key players. But on the flip side, you also need to be able to set their expectations. Um, I think we've all been on this call where <laughs> They don't care, they want it now. They don't want it in a day, they don't want it in a week, they want it yesterday, and they want it now. So for your expectation setting, the biggest thing is to get started early. Set those expectations. I cannot move forward on X until you give me Y. I need you to know that I'm dependent on you to move forward. I need your sign off on design before I'm going to spend money to start building. I need your information on what you want me to do before I can do it. And if you keep starting that early, maybe not that forcefully at first, hopefully not that forcefully at first, if you just start going, okay, so here's how it's gonna go and here's what we need to move forward, that starts setting those expectations and making sure people know who's responsible for what instead of having that meltdown towards the end of the day, <laughs> towards the end of the project or when they realize that deadline's been missed. And make sure you've got the, the stakeholders involved as early as you can. So I think we've all been in that project on some end or another where it's like, so yeah, we forgot to talk to this stakeholder over here and he's got an entirely different set of requirements that we kind of didn't take into account because we didn't know about him. We want to try to avoid that. It's not always avoidable, especially when you're working with clients and you can't always see behind that main contact that you have. But you need to make sure that you have a plan for that. And if, when that does bubble up, you need to acknowledge that it's a change you need to acknowledge what the impact of that change is. So this goes back to, okay, I need, I need to add this feature. What is that? What are my options? How can I get around it? Can I drop a piece of something here? Am I running ahead of schedule over there that I might be able to slip it in? Do I need more money? Do I need more time? Do I need more people? What is it exactly that I need? Another big thing with setting expectations, especially with stakeholders, is be realistic. 
I think we've all been part of that team where somebody over promises and under delivers. And that really leads for some awkward conversations. And it also sets expectations poorly. So I'm not saying lie. I'm not saying lie to anybody. I'm just saying be realistic in your responses. Can you give that to me tomorrow? Well, let me see what else is going on. No, I probably can't, but I can get it to you by Tuesday. Is that okay? If not, help me understand what's okay. And if I've got other things I'm doing for you, what can I switch out to get you this by Tuesday? And if they say nothing, then that's a whole other negotiation. Um, <laughs> we've all been there too. I can tell by the faces in the room. But if they say nothing, that's, that's when you have to start negotiating. But if you get to the point of being realistic with them, there's going to be a little more trust built there on your average stakeholder. We all have the uh, not so uh, average stakeholders that we've dealt with before, but it's for another time. Um, be clear also in your communication as if you think, if you're, the more specific you are, the better your expectations are going to be because it goes back to that whole language. When I say swing, I mean one thing, someone else sees something else in their head, someone else sees something else in their head. But again, if I say, well, it's a tire swing and the tire is this big and the rope is this long and it hangs from a tree that that's, with a branch that that's high, we're gonna be on a bigger page. So the more clear you can be, the better off you're going to be. Also, uh, make sure everyone's clear with their roles and responsibilities. What am I responsible for? Why would someone come to me versus my head developer versus the stakeholder versus a manager? Make sure everyone knows what part they're playing in that project and they have a little bit clearer expectation on, okay, I'm having this problem, I need to go to that person. And the default as project manager is they're gonna come to you because you're gonna traffic cop that in a lot of cases. And then make sure you also, within that, have an escalation strategy of if things do get out of hand, either on our side or your side, this is how we move up that chain and this is who we go to talk to that can help unblock us, that can help move us that can help get things moving again or solve those problems. And then the other thing is try to make sure you're communicating. Just tell them the good news. Tell them the bad news. Tell them the bad news when you know about it. Don't try to cover it up and then tell them. Be frank with them. Be a little honest. Talk to them about changes and talk to them about status, whether that's in a meeting whether that's in um, email or phone call, however they prefer it, make sure you've got that status going. And if you can, and I know this is so much harder these days because we're all just distributed, there's still something to be said with FaceTime with your big stakeholders. So if it's possible, which I know it's not always, um, getting in front of them in person also helps build that relationship and partnership. And if you can't, there's always things like Skype or HipChat or Slack or Hangouts or something where you can start reading those facial expressions and getting to know each other. That also helps with any communication blunders too. If we have a tone and email problem as we're getting to know each other, hey, we've all been there where that tone, you, you read it like three days later and you're like, oh, I really didn't mean it that mean. Um, I don't know how to fix that. But if you've got that relationship and they know how you, how you talk and see your, your body language on a somewhat regular basis, you're gonna, that's not gonna be taken as seriously as if they're just still getting to know you. Um, your stakeholders and your setting expectations and those relationships are going to be one of the most important parts of your project. Simply because we're all in this together, we all need to get through it together and we can't do it without each other. So as soon as we can get that relationship built and get things moving in the right direction, it's a little easier to keep expectations in check. So a little bit about risk. Um, I picked this uh, particular picture because risk is often that tightrope. You don't wanna be the ultimate paranoid project manager who says everything's a risk and oh my gosh, the world's on fire. But at the same time, there's that whole keeping things in check, keeping with reality, no, keeping our eyes up on what might be coming without, cause, it's without causing chaos. So it's very much that tightrope that we're walking over, over the cliff uh, with the water running below us. 
Um, unfortunately, I can't go too far into risk. I'm going to cover what I can. And uh, what am I doing on time? I've got about 20 minutes. So project risk is really defined as an uncertain event or condition that if it occurs, it can be either a positive or negative influence on your project. So risk can come from a lot of different places. It can come from unknown stakeholders like we just talked about where they're like, oh, hey, I have all these things I needed to do and I didn't tell you, <laughs> sorry. Um, it can come from external dependencies. I, I remember one time I was working on a data center refresh and we had everybody lined up to start moving their stuff and about a week before we were supposed to start putting stuff on hardware, we get a call from our manufacturer that there a tsunami had hit where the manufacturing plant was and they had, we, now know, we had no ETA on when our servers would get to us. Not really something you can predict. Not really something we accounted for. We did after that, but the first time that happened, it really wasn't something that we even dawned on us at that time. We're so used to, we order it, it comes. We order it, it shows up and, you know, gets on the boat and then eventually it's in the data center in Virginia. So we were working on it and it impacted a massive launch at that point because we didn't have your new servers. They, we had, we had no control over it. Ultimately, we found another provider, but it still added time to the project that we had absolutely no idea about. Your customer stakeholder availability is also a big one. If you're expecting sign off or information from them and they're on a three week vacation, that could be a risk to your project if they are running up against that vacation where they're about to leave. That can impact you greatly. Um, technology. Sometimes technology doesn't work the way we want it to. And uh, when that happens, that can certainly be a risk if we're trying to code something new or do something we've never done before and we start hitting roadblocks that we didn't anticipate, that can be a risk. Scope, schedule, both risks, because they're always changing. We want them to change as little as possible, but they do actually change, so that can be a risk. And then a new law could come in and you know cause a risk. So if you were in the middle of doing something with government and they said, okay, well, we now require everything be in FedRAMP and you don't have a FedRAMP provider, that could be a problem because you now can't have nowhere to launch your site on. So there's a, that's not a comprehensive list by any matter, but the idea is make sure you're looking not just at your immediate surroundings for that risk. Look anywhere you can think of. But also remember that risk can be positive or negative. And that's another thing is as project managers, we tend to focus on those negative risks of if we miss this, we're going to be late or we're going to go over budget or we're going to lose this resource or, 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 or. And okay, well, what if something works out where we didn't expect it to and it's awesome and now we have a new great problem of, I don't know what to do with all this attention that I'm getting from my project. You know, people are interested in it. It's selling or this piece of technology is really interesting to the community and I need to be able to account for the positive risk as well as that negative risk. And the key really here is just like everything else we've been talking about is you want to make sure you identify it. Usually initially it's going to be brainstorming just like, just like everything else with your project of, okay guys, here are the risks I see. What risks am I forgetting? What do you see? What are things that we need to keep an eye out for? I like to put together a risk register which basically has an identification what the risk is. Is there a high likelihood, medium likelihood, or low? And then I'll do the same for impact. So if it's, yeah, this is probably gonna happen, but if it doesn't, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. I'm gonna pay different attention to, this is really probably gonna happen and we're derailed if it does. So it helps me classify my risks that way. And then I'll also, um, have a date that if it happen, you know, if I think that it needs to happen by, if, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen by this date. So I don't pay attention to old risks and who's responsible for it. And if we have a response and there are a lot of different responses that you can have, you can have, um, we're just going to accept it and deal with it 
you know, it's, there's nothing we can do about it, so we're just going to have to accept the consequences. We can avoid it. So for the example of the server with the tsunami, um, I, could, I could try and find someone who doesn't manufacture in a tsunami-prone area, though I don't know how possible that is anymore. Um, tsunamis are showing up everywhere. That has a coast anyway. Um, I can, uh, so I can avoid it, I can accept it, I can transfer it so I can buy insurance, or I can make it somebody else's problem, or I can just, it, there's a fourth one that I'm forgetting right now, I believe it's ignore. I'll have to look at that. Um, so those are my four responses for negative risk, is what am I going to do, how am I going to respond, mitigate. Um, how am I going to mitigate that, ris that risk and really go from there and figure out exactly how I want to respond to it. And I'm going to review that and I'm going to keep reviewing that. And as risks fall off and okay, this isn't a risk anymore. I've got the servers in my data center, not a risk. I can stop it. Are there new ones coming up? So you want to keep talking about your risks. I'll usually do it weekly um, or if we're meeting less often than weekly, I'll do it when we meet. If we meet daily, I'll usually do it weekly, just because talking about it every day is usually a little much. Um, so your key on that is identification and then continuous review, continuous determining of your response. Some of the tools, I know, um, I know there's way more out there that people use. Um, <laughs> I know, uh, Small project, I've seen people do all of their project management outside of Excel, in Excel. Not sure I recommend that, um, but it's certainly there. And if there's some other options, if you want to do collaborative, there's Active Collab. A lot of people use Jira, Basecamp, 5PM. Uh, OmniPlan is the yellow one that has no name. Pro MS Project. So there's a bunch of different tools out there that you can use. The best thing I can say for a tool is figure out what you want it to do and then try and figure out what fits it the best. There's never going to be an exact match. And I'm curious what the project managers out here use. Uh, we use Trello. Trello? Yeah. We did use ActiveCloud, but we got rid of it and we're now Trello and Nice. We use uh, You use what? You use that one. Why do you hate it? It gets, you can get carried away with it. It's like okay. almost too free flowing. Like you can just spin off cards and tasks and active club, active club okay. is a bit more structured, yeah. Active club is very structured, I find. I've not used Trello, but it sounds like it can, it sounds like it can get out of hand very quickly. Yeah, how, how do you control that? How do you keep, <laughs> how do you keep that reined in? I'm, We're working on it. Okay. <laughs> That's a fair answer. Still working on it. Yeah. All right. Any other tools that people use that you want to talk about? We use Google Docs a lot. Google Docs. Yeah. We're not allowed to use Google Docs where I am because of yeah. certain FedRAMP restrictions. Yeah. Um, but it is handy. I have a lot of clients that use it. It's definitely an easy tool. Um, any feedback, feel free to tweet me. Um, there's my handle again. That's all I have for you guys. What do you guys have for me? What questions can I answer? It's Saturday afternoon, I'm seeing a lot of blank faces. <laughs> Sorry, do I, I didn't hear the second part of that question. How, do you, how, do you, uh, how far do you go with that initially? And then how do you manage the constant changes that it requires? So when I'm going through the task identification, how far do I go? Or? OK. 
Okay. Yep. So, uh, just to repeat for anyone on the, who didn't hear you, basically it's, you know, in, in the beginning of a project, this will also make sure I'm getting your question right, the beginning of the project, the tasks are very, very well defined, and then as you look out further, the tasks are more and more loosely defined and always changing. How do we handle that? Is that? Yeah. Okay. Um, it really depends on what version of, what methodology you're using for for your software development. If it's waterfall, you should be very, very granular all the way to the end. A lot of dev shops aren't using waterfall anymore. Um, I've seen a lot of dev shops that are doing kind of a bizarre hybrid between agile and waterfall because it's a hard, it's a hard transition to make that jump from pure waterfall to pure agile. And there's a lot of figuring out new processes. And that's usually where I, I've heard the we're very, very specific at the beginning, and then we kind of start getting bigger and bigger as we go. And for those, are you doing sprints? We do sprints, but we don't really adhere to them. OK. Yeah, I've, I've been there. You do, where you do the sprints, you don't adhere to them. The biggest thing on that is your sprint planning. And if you're not doing sprint planning, you should probably start talking about doing sprint planning where you start breaking those big tasks down into something that's actually achievable during that sprint. And with the changes, again, it's really that communication piece of, I need to make sure that, okay, you've just changed everything on me. You realize what we've just done. There may not be anything usable if everything changed or X, you know, this sprint is now, we're, we're not using it, so we need more time or we need to drop functionality or we, you know, we need to figure out what our options are and here, here Mr. Stakeholder, here's your list of options, choose one. Um, let us know what it is that you're looking to do. And I saw some nodding over here. I didn't know if you guys had anything else to add on that. Oh no, just I've worked in the bizarre hybrid, it's um, challenging. Yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging. Okay. Some of our clients are solely agile, so we adapt to fit that, and then some of ours are not. Yeah, so that's sure. that's a challenge. I think I saw a question over here. Yeah, they're doing more and more on um, research on how many projects a person should be working on at any given time, and then how many hours you should actually schedule them for. So we've got an eight-hour day, but realistically, nobody's working all eight hours of that eight-hour day. They're going to get up. They're going to need coffee. They're going to get interrupted by someone at least once or twice per hour. Um, there's, there's all of this research going in. Is like you really can't plan for eight hours. The last number I heard, I think, was six and a half hours is realistically what you can plan for in a day. And that number goes down even further if you've got this person spread across several projects because there's that time for content switching of, OK, I'm doing this, this. OK, now I've got to put this down. I'm going to go start here. OK, now what was this again? And there, there's that time, that transition time that isn't accounted for because we're like, OK, we've got eight hours. I'm guilty of this, too. I've done. I've got eight hours in a day. 
you're going to use those eight hours and you're going to work on these three things. And it's like, no, realistically, that's not going to happen because it takes too much time to keep switching from, okay, I'm doing this project. All right, I'm putting this down. Now I've got to go look at this one and figure out where I am on that process. So there's a lot of uh, interesting research coming out on that field right now. Any other questions? Yes. When you're estimating time and or money, do you have a kind of methodology of, you know, I've seen places talk about card systems with Agile, or how do you get enough input to have a valid estimate instead of my best guess and one other guy's best guess? Right. So um, estimation is tricky because there's um, not as much science behind it as we would like. I could be talking to a senior engineer and ask him, well, how long does it take? And he'll be like, uh, well, you know, that's, that's nothing. It's like an hour. And then I go to the junior engineer who's assigned to it, and she's like, I'm sorry, an hour what? So it's, for me, I, I'm fortunate enough that I'm working with the same project teams on my end. The clients obviously are always different. But on my end, I'm fortunate enough where I get to know the team, and I know who I know who overestimates. I know who underestimates. I know who I can go to. I, it's still a lot of art, unfortunately. Um, and I saw, where was I? Somebody did a, a talk on turning estimation into a science and not an art, and I think it was DrupalCon LA. That was really, it, was, it, was that DrupalCon LA? Okay. Uh, it's by like three different. It was by three different people, I want to say. But they had um, they had gotten further than most project managers I've seen on on getting that, and I encourage you to find the talk from DrupalCon LA and look at it. But um, basically, it is figuring out how do you turn that because there's so many unknowns when we go into a technology project. It's like I don't. Am I, are they learning a new code base? Because that's going to be a while. That's going to cause, you know, what normally should be a, an hour task for someone who knows it is going to be a lot longer for someone who doesn't. So for me, it's really considering the source. You know, you're going to learn who, who your overestimators are. You're going to learn who your overpromisers are. Figure out um, the level of the person doing it. And then, you know, if you know that they're an overpromiser, tack some time onto it. If you know they're, if you know they uh, go a little conservative, maybe shave an hour or two off of it. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you on that one. I really do. Yeah. So we're, con yeah, we're, we're contract basis where, where I am. Um, I've been on the time and materials side. Clients generally aren't fans of time and materials because way too many unknowns. Um, but as far as uh, managing risk and factoring it in, generally when I'm putting together the schedule and we're going through our risk plan, it's like, okay, you realize that if this risk happens, it's going to do X, Y, and Z to the timeline. Um, and generally, people don't want the time built in unless it's, you know, we know that it's going to happen, at which point it's no longer a risk. It's an issue, right? Um, so it really depends on the client and how conservative they are as well. So my biggest thing with risk is I start, as soon as I see the big one, I will start beating that drum and I will tell anyone and everyone who will listen to me that's on that project that this is, this is about to happen. This is coming. I need you to pay attention to me, please. And I need you to accept that this is happening. And if it does happen, I need you to tell me how you want me to handle it. Here are all your choices. Please pick one. Um, but that's usually what I'll do. And I, some, of, uh, some of our risks have financial implications and some of them don't. And it really depends on where that falls. And if 
there is a financial implication and it's, it's a risk, but it's not one that your company is involved in. So for example, I was doing a giant migration. They had to be off their servers by September 30th, but they weren't getting me the credentials in time. There's no way we were gonna take that financial impact. It was, hey guys, remember those credentials you promised me? I need those if you want me to meet this deadline. If I don't, you're going to be responsible for this because we can't do our jobs. This is the amount of time I told you I need. Any other questions? All right. Mm -hmm. No, it was, um, let me see if I can find it real quick. I'm on PowerPoint. Yes, thank you. Who did that one? Uh, okay. So yeah, it was DrupalCon LA estimation, science, not an art. Thank you. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. All right, well, thanks, guys.